Okay, good day to everyone. Thank you for joining another SAS seminar. Uh, today we have as a speaker, our dear friend and a former fellow of, uh, of the Center for Advanced Studies, Ivan Zerovac. Um, Ivan Zerovac is currently an independent scholar who holds two PhDs, uh, one from University in Trieste, another from University in Rijeka, both in philosophy. He is an author of uh, books, Epistemic Democracy and Political Legitimacy, and the book, John Stuart Mill and Epistemic Democracy, which he will, uh, in a way, focus on today. Um, in general, he writes about a range of topics in ethics and political philosophy, political epistemology, I would also add, uh, including about political legitimacy, social justice, and democratic theory. So without further ado, I would give the floor to Johan. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Marco Luca, for this kind introduction. Uh, I will start sharing my screen now, hopefully. We won't encounter any obstacles. Oh, okay, and now this one. Great, uh, I hope everyone is able to see the screen and uh, I hope uh, you will like uh, the talk I'm going to give and I'm definitely certain that I'm going to enjoy the discussion afterwards because this is a book that has recently been published. It's been like two months or something like that uh, since the book was published and uh, every uh, chance to actually debate and discuss uh, the content of the book will help me a lot to uh, improve uh, the future versions as well as uh, to publish uh, additional papers clarifying some things that have not been uh, clearly put uh, in the book itself. So uh, the focus of my research uh, is on epistemic democracy and my first book is basically focused on, on epistemic democracy and political legitimacy. And in the second one, and this is the research I was uh, doing for the five years at the University of Rijeka, actually I focused more on the history of political philosophy. Uh, and I wanted to contribute to the ongoing discussions by portraying John Stuart Mill, a famous British philosopher and scholar, as an epistemic democrat. In fact, I'm going to claim uh, that by interpreting Mill as an epistemic democrat, uh, we can bring unity to his political thought and we can better understand a lot of his ideas and arguments expressed at that time. Okay, so uh, let me continue on. <clears throat> um, this is the, the book, it was recently published. If anyone wants it, I can send you the pre-print -pre version already with pages and everything in PDF. Uh, so just let me know and I will be more than happy to distribute it around. I cannot send the final version because of the copyrights and so on and so on. Uh, it's quite expensive now, but if you want a hard copy, it's best to buy it in two years when the prices go down. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay, let's start uh, with the talk. So the book focuses on the epistemic or cognitive character of democratic Sorry, you got muted, Ivan. I don't know how, why this happened. Unmute, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea why that happened. <laughs> so, uh, the book focuses on the epistemic character of democratic institutions. Uh, in Mill's political thought, and it uses this interpretation as uh, some kind of a, a unifying uh, idea behind uh, Mill's political thought. Uh, also, I believe that the research uh, done here can help us resolve certain tensions that exist nowadays in contemporary political philosophy and in contemporary political epistemology in particular, about the conflict between political and moral values on the one hand, the values such as participation, equality, and so on, and uh, the conflict of these values with epistemic values like knowledge, expertise, competence on the other hand. Uh, as we all know, nowadays most of the discussions uh, within political philosophy uh, that regard political legitimacy in fact address this problem between unequal distribution of competence and equal distribution of moral and political rights. And now there are a lot of uh, scholars debating, taking different sides, different positions. And I'm actually hoping that by clearly reading Mill uh, as an epistemic Democrat, we can bring some order into this chaotic debate. 
And uh, finally, the book offers a new interpretation of Mill's political thought, but also discusses a little bit some applications of Mill's political theory in the contemporary world. And also just a, a sneak peek, uh, tomorrow I'm going to give another talk uh, in Coffee House Debates, uh, Science Popularization Project in Lauran about uh, applying Mill's political thought on contagious diseases uh, like COVID and so on, and how can harm principle be uh, employed in these situations. But to get back on track, so this is what the book is about. Uh, here are some uh, methodological uh, notes. So uh, this is not a book in history. Uh, I combine historical analysis on the one hand, I'm trying to see what Mill had to say to interpret Mill, but also I'm trying to do some kind of philosophical analysis and to evaluate Mill's work simultaneously. So not only to determine what Mill had in mind, but also where his thoughts well-founded, well-argued, and what can we do with his thoughts today? Uh, so, I try to put Mill's thoughts in the context of contemporary debates to analyze how Mill's argument from the mid 19th century can be strengthened uh, nowadays, how they can be improved and how or whether they can be implemented in political practice. And again, uh, the focus is not on what Mill thought about particular laws and political decisions, although his arguments and criticisms are quite valuable, but the focus is on what follows from Mill's theory and what can we do with Mill's theory today. And this is basically uh, the contents of the, of the book and my doctoral research. Uh, basically, it tracks Mill uh, from uh, his two uh, criteria of uh, political legitimacy, uh, all the way to the value of epistemic value of political conflict and the epistemic value of democracy uh, to a list of filtering mechanisms uh, Mill proposes. Filtering mechanisms are some institutional uh, constraints uh, put upon decision-making procedures that kind of try to filter public will. Uh, filtering public will basically means uh, not that we have the will of the elite that replaces the will of the people, but we actually try to remove some uh, epistemically harmful conditions in which public will can be expressed. For example, during riots, uh, during uh, uprisings and so on, but also uh, in midst of fake news, false information and so on. Uh, Mill's idea is basically that we need democracy, but democracy we are going to have and democracy we're going to use to make political decisions has to be filtered in a way that it has to introduce certain mechanisms that will, for example, separate the moment of deliberation from the moment of making decisions that will separate the moment of discussing about political aims uh, with the moment of implementing these uh, ideas into the final uh, political proposals and laws. Uh, and finally, I'm, I'm going to focus uh, a little bit more on the two that I find most interesting and highly debated the, today, not in contemporary discussions in general, but in the contemporary interpretations of Mill's thought. And that is uh, his uh, arguments regarding the epistemic role of partisanship, because nowadays most uh, epistemologists think that partisanship has a, a profoundly harmful effect on political deliberation. Uh, and a lot of interprets uh, think Mill also believe that partisanship harms political deliberation. Uh, in fact, I'm going to prove and to try to demonstrate that it's not the case that Mill was aware of some of the dangers, but still thought that political partisanship can be a useful tool to filtering public will. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about anti-paternalism in Mill's political thought. So uh, I started by uh, describing and indicating that I interpret Mill as an epistemic democrat. What does that mean? Well, for those who are not uh, aware about uh, the ongoing discussion in political philosophy, and I know a lot of you are not, uh, just basically because the Center for Advanced Studies uh, is actually uh, getting fellows from many different areas within humanities and social sciences and not within philosophy and not only within political philosophy. So epistemic democracy is a theory of democracy that basically says that we evaluate the quality of government 
or the quality of the decision authorization procedures, procedures by which collective decisions are authorized, uh, and the ability of uh, these procedures to produce legitimate decisions, at least in part by evaluating its epistemic qualities, or to put it uh, more bluntly and uh, more directly, we focus on how does democracy contribute to our production of knowledge and how does democracy uh, help us implement the knowledge we have and use it to make better political decisions. And of course, <clears throat> the idea behind the epistemic democracy is first that we have this epistemic criterion we use to uh, evaluate political procedures. And the second one, of course, has to be that democracy meets this criterion better than any other procedure. So the second important, important aspect of epistemic democracy is the idea that democracy is a form of government or a form of decision authorization procedure that realizes the epistemic quality to a significant degree, enough to be considered the best form of government and enough to have legitimacy generating potential. Idea, idea is, Democracy is a procedure that produces legitimate political decisions, at least in part because it produces high quality epistemic consequences, epistemic uh, decisions and so on, or because it creates a fertile epistemic environment. Uh, and of course, uh, the interpretation of Mill as an epistemic democrat is not completely novel. There are many other authors who have hinted in that direction. Uh, for example, David Eslund and Fabian Petter, who have both been uh, for more than one occasion guests at our University of Rijeka, uh, emphasize Mill's demand for procedure independent standard of quality of political decisions. So they also start, they start by interpreting Mill as a uh, epistemic democrat, but they do so uh, sporadically in some uh, in a one or two sentences and so on. Some other uh, authors like Helen Landermore or James Devil uh, tend to put greater focus uh, on Mill as epistemic liberal than epistemic democrat. Nonetheless, they still focus on Mill's uh, epistemic uh, concerns uh, and the focus uh, on political epistemology in Mill's thought. Uh, nonetheless, they also do that in a very, very uh, brief paragraphs, uh, a few pages at most. Uh, so my idea and my motivation behind my research was actually to fully elaborate this interpretation of Mill as an epistemic democrat. Uh, and uh, I start by uh, indicating Mill's two criteria of good government. Uh, and Mill famously argues uh, that in order to uh, be a good form of government, uh, some form of government has to both improve the competences, the intellectual and moral competences of its citizens to make them better citizens. And it also has to organize the existing capacities within society in the most fruitful or the most efficient way. And Mill's idea is basically the form of government that manages to uh, meet these two criteria to the highest extent that is best at educating citizens and arranging their competences to produce efficient results is the best form of government and is also the form of government that will have political legitimacy. So Mill's idea is first that governments should promote formal and informal education. That is the way of improving intellectual and moral capacities of citizens. However, while even the spot rule can promote formal education. We can have like uh, enlightened absolutists and so on, investing in schools, building new schools, uh, having old children uh, attending some classes and so on, uh, promoting literacy and so on. Uh, so even the despotic rule can promote formal education. Informal education, one which represents citizens' self-improvement can only take place, according to Mill, in deliberative, participative and democratic institutions. So Mill's idea is basically, yes, a benevolent despot can teach you some important things. Nonetheless, uh, if we want to focus on self-development, when we are the authority of what we want to perfect and how we want to develop ourselves, we cannot have absolutism or despotism as a form of government that puts down what we have to learn and how we have to develop our capacities. We have to do that ourselves. And we can do that in participative and deliberative institutions. 
Of course, <clears throat> this does not mean that the democratic government should neglect formal education. It basically means that other forms of government can also focus and meet requirements regarding formal education. Formal education, in fact, uh, even takes place as a, a prerequisite for the self-improvement of citizens. Nonetheless, self-improvement itself cannot take place in or under democrat, um, despotic, absolutistic uh, institutions. So Mill's idea will, of course, be that democracy or some form of deliberative participative institutionalized uh, procedure of decision making will help us self-improve or will be better at improving informal education of citizens. However, Mill also clearly rejects the egalitarian position which attributes equal level of competence to all citizens. Mill says basically knowledge and not only technical, but all kinds of knowledge is unequally distributed within the population. This means that although a form of government has to improve the capacities, both moral and intellectual capacities of its citizens, when it tries to organize these capacities to produce the best results, it has to be aware that capacities in the end are not equally distributed. And According to this and following this unequal distribution of citizens' competences, we have to shape the decision-making and decision authorization procedures to harvest the knowledge some citizens have and to minimize the harmful impact the incompetence of some citizens can have in the decision-making process. And Mill famously uh, differentiated between two types of knowledge. This will be important for later chapters in the book, between what he calls instrumental or technical knowledge and moral knowledge. I will talk a little bit more about this uh, when we talk about the procedures in the fourth or fifth chapter. So Mill's idea is basically that political institutions have to be organized to make the optimal use of both types of knowledge. And both types of knowledge, according to Mill, are unequally distributed within the population. So uh, that was, uh, th those were the two main criteria Mill has for uh, evaluating forms of government. And now we come to another important uh, aspect in his political thought, and that is the value of political conflict. Namely, uh, in contemporary political philosophy, we differentiate between two different uh, approaches uh, to this topic. Uh, the first one, deliberative holism, holds the idea uh, that a very optimistic idea that uh, public deliberation is epistemically valuable because it leads, or at least it has a high tendency to lead to a consensus on certain substantive reasons for or against some political decision. So the idea is deliberation is good because it produces consensus. And consensus is good because it increases legitimacy. If we can all agree uh, after deliberation that something is the correct decision, this will increase both the normative and the descriptive legitimacy of the decision in question. But as you might guess, and as many political scientists and uh, psychologists uh, who deal in social psychology can uh, confirm, this is a very optimistic and somehow unrealistic approach. Deliberation often tends to uh, widen the gap between citizens and not uh, put them all on the same side. So there's also another position, a, a more pessimistic one, that nonetheless sees epistemic value in political conflict. Nonetheless, this position called uh, deliberative agonism uh, basically claims that uh, we cannot expect uh, deliberation to result in a consensus. In fact, in many cases, or in most cases, it does not do that. Uh, deliberation will end up in a permanent state of disagreement. Nonetheless, this does not imply that deliberation is epistemically meaningless or that it doesn't have an epistemic value. In fact, it does. And I believe that there are good reasons to portray Mill as a deliberative agonist. So a person uh, believing that deliberation is valuable, not because it brings us uh, closer to consensus, but 
as someone believing that deliberation and political conflict is valuable for epistemic reasons, even if it does not produce consensus on political issues. And I want to uh, address some of the reasons why I interpret Mill this way. Mill's arguments uh, from uh, his famous essay on liberty primarily regard instrumental role of freedom of expression. So when Mill says that freedom of expression is important, Mill is basically saying it's important for other things. Yes, it is important in itself, but it's basically important for other things. It is important because it helps us get to truth, or at least it's important because it helps us uh, produce better epistemic judgments, better epistemic results from the discussion we have, and so on. So the conflict uh, in politics uh, both has educative role because it helps us see other people's positions, see the weaknesses and strengths of our own position, but it also has a constructive role, uh, namely by making compromises, not necessarily consensus, by compromises with others, we can actually produce new ideas, new arguments and new positions that can help us, that, that would not exist otherwise without uh, different and opposing uh, stances and judgments coming in, coming in deliberation, seeing that neither of them is as strong as was originally thought, and then we have a constructive role, constructing some new uh, ideas, new principles from the deliberation. And uh, of course, Mill supports and contains agonism through different political institutions and mechanisms. And for Mill scholars, this is uh, a very important and very beautiful when you see how it traces from his entire political work, uh, from the idea of proportionalism, from the idea of representation, from the idea of uh, rejection of pledges, a uh, plural voting proposal, and so on, you can see that in different mechanisms Mill put in place, one of his motives is always to keep the deliberation going, uh, to uh, prevent instances in which there is a complete domination of one uh, side in the political arena. Uh, he always wants uh, deliberation to take place uh, because he believes deliberation is epistemically valuable. After that, we come to the maybe central uh, part of the book, and that is uh, why do we interpret Mill as an epistemic democrat? And what kind of epistemic democracy Mill has in mind when he writes about two criteria of good government? Contemporary debate on political uh, legitimacy, especially when we focus on the epistemic quality of uh, governments, uh, is typically divided in two camps, monistic accounts and non-monistic accounts. Monistic accounts claim that democracy, or as a matter of fact, any form of government, it can be despotism or a theocracy or something other, is valuable because it implements one important epistemic value. And this important epistemic value can be outcome-oriented, and procedure oriented or procedure oriented. And so we can differentiate between pure proceduralism, typically represented by earlier work by Fabian Petter, for example, but also uh, according to some authors uh, by um, Denise Thompson, Amy Gutman, and others, um, maybe even Emanuela Cheva uh, out of these uh, people who have visited our university. So uh, pure proceduralism basically says that democracy is valuable and democracy has legitimacy because it has some moral intrinsic properties that granted legitimacy generating potential. So basically, because in democracy treats us all as equal, morally equal and politically equal citizens, and since democracy gives every citizen an equal chance to participate in the decision-making process, Therefore, democracy is legitimate. It is morally superior to other decision-making procedures. Instrumentalism, which is in the same monistic camp by or the completely different position and completely opposite to proceduralism, basically says that we evaluate forms of government uh, by appealing to or by focusing on their instrumental qualities, the results such forms of government produce. So we can say, for example, that democracy 
is the best form of government because it produces the best consequences, because it produces the best political decisions, or because it is best for educating people or supporting their self-development, self-perfection, and so on and so on. So while in proceduralism, pure proceduralism, we focus only on the intrinsic qualities of the decision-making procedure, in the instrumentalist accounts, we focus on the results of the procedure. We don't care how the procedure works. We care what are the results, uh, what are the outcomes of the procedure. And the procedure that has the best outcomes is the procedure that has legitimate generating potential. Finally, there are some uh, non-monistic accounts, uh, like David Estland's account, that try to combine both procedural and instrumental uh, criteria, but I'm not going to talk about them uh, now. They are mostly focused on my first uh, book on epistemic democracy. After this division here, uh, I'm going to uh, interpret Mill as a democratic instrumentalist. So someone who focuses on the quality of uh, political decisions when he assesses the legitimacy generating potential of procedures. And this is very typical for consequentialist or utilitarian philosophers. Uh, if you are a consequentialist of, or utilitarian philosopher, you are most likely going to end up into some kind of instrumentalism because you are going to attribute value to the final states, uh, the end states of actions and of procedures, and you are going to end up endorsing some form of political instrumentalism. And Mill seems to embrace this approach when he asserts that the best form of government is the one that produces the best results. His position is monistic, since only the consequences of a particular form of government, that is its ability to produce decisions and other political outcomes that improve the well-being of citizens and improve their capacities. So uh, only this, consequences are taken into account where we assess the quality and the legitimacy generating potential of forms of government. And in fact, we have a quote from Mill that clearly supports this interpretation. And Mill writes that ideally best form of government is the one which is attended with the greatest amount of beneficial consequences, immediate and prospective. And so we can see uh, that Mill rejects, for example, despotism, the rule by one, wise uh, individual, even if he is benevolent, even if he's wise and so on, by appealing to certain epistemic arguments. Namely, Mill believes that despotism produces undesirable political outcomes in the long term. Namely, it both uh, fails to properly uh, improve citizens' uh, self-development process or citizens' informal education, education driven by the citizens themselves, uh, but it also, Mill believes, fails to properly uh, grasp uh, the competence part. Namely, although the benevolent despot uh, might know good solutions to different problems, he might, he's not in an epistemically privileged position to know all the problems relevant for different social groups of different economic, financial, uh, cultural backgrounds, and so on, to be able uh, to use this and to harness this knowledge that is distributed within the population. Therefore, Mill's rejection of uh, despotism is strong, but nonetheless conditional. Namely, his idea is we might approve some kind of despotism, of course, benevolent despotism, uh, for barbaric nations, or, uh, for example, for little children in contemporary societies. So for those who have failed to reach the minimal level of competencies needed for their future self-development, actually having a teacher, having a despot, having someone who says, you have to learn how to read it, to write it, that is good for you, for that is good for your future interests and so on and so on, might be legitimate and justified. Nonetheless, once citizens have reached certain minimal level of development, once they have become capable of self-improving themselves, then despotism tends to hinder their efforts instead of improving them. The for, for me, democracy is supported by epistemic arguments. It helps improve citizens' competences and it helps organize them to make efficient decisions. Uh, of course, uh, in order uh, to uh, properly uh, 
evaluate, <clears throat> uh, but also to properly implement this epistemic value, democracy needs a set of uh, filtering mechanisms. Uh, in the first place, mechanisms that foster representation and deliberation. Uh, these two aspects will maximize the positive effects both on education and on competence. And now let's see what are these filtering mechanisms Mill has in mind. I'm not going to go deeply into each of these, uh, mostly because uh, some of them are quite outdated and we don't think they are uh, important nowadays. Nonetheless, some others are still used, but not in the voting procedures in the elections, but in the voting procedures in the parliaments. So we'll see why Mill believed that uh, such mechanisms that we still use in the parliament should be used in the broader scenarios. So having simply having a representative and deliberative democratic procedure is not enough to maximize democracy's epistemic potential. Namely, we need a list of mechanisms that can help us filter the public will. And these mechanisms will introduce indirectness in the decision-making process. And indirectness, according to Mill, has a huge epistemic value because it separates the moment of the deliberation from the moment of decision and it separates the moment of uh, deliberation about political aims with the decision making process focused on means or uh, instruments we are going to implement to achieve those aims. Now Mill believes that these uh, mechanisms introduce competence in politics by for example introducing the division between epistemic uh, and political labor. So the idea that we have professional political representatives, people who are paid to sit in the parliaments to uh, discuss things and so on, but also that we have uh, committees within the parliament, that we have government composed of experts and so on. Uh, the idea is that this kind of division of government will help introduce competence in politics. He also believes that these uh, filtering mechanisms uh, will enable better representation of relevant ideas and opinions. For example, uh, he believes that, uh, I don't know, a proportional representation combined with a plural voting proposal will enable some important ideas and opinions to be heard, although they would not be heard in some other aggregative procedures. Furthermore, he believes that it enables better interaction between experts and citizens and fosters the educative role of democracy. And the interesting thing, uh, and I believe that the novel and the innovative part of my uh, work is basically uh, putting focus and emphasis uh, on the fact that Mill offers an epistemic justification for each of the, these mechanisms. So we can find them in different books published over 20 years from uh, 1850 to 1870. Uh, and in all of them, you can find very clear epistemic justification of each of these filtering mechanisms. Some of the mechanisms Mill uh, suggests and introduces are, for example, open ballot. The idea that there is no secret ballot when we go out to vote, uh, everyone should be allowed to know how we voted in the elections. Mill believes that this will produce external inducements to motivate citizens to do their duty properly. Uh, namely, we are going to be held accountable for the vote, for the ballot we cast in the elections. Of course, Mill is aware uh, that secrecy has some of its advantages as well. For example, the idea that you cannot be easily coerced, manipulated by your entrepreneur or by your boss or something else. Nonetheless, Mill believes that maybe in Bentham's time, maybe in the very beginning of the 19th century, that was the case. Nonetheless, today in <laughs> 1870s and probably even more uh, today in 21st century, uh, the epistemic value of open ballot uh, greatly uh, is uh, far greater than the epistemic value of secret ballot uh, in a way that it protects us from manipulations and so on. Also, Mill believed that uh, not all citizens should have uh, voting uh, rights. The idea is basically that those who are unable to meet some minimal educational criteria should be left out of the suffrage or should not have any voting rights. Of course, the idea is once they manage to get these minimal qualifications, they should be allowed to vote. But before that, 
those who are, for example, in the 21st century, those who are unable to, or who, those who do not want to uh, finish uh, elementary school, or those who are unable to write and read and so on, who have failed to meet some minimal uh, criteria, uh, according to Mill, should be left out of the decision-making process or in the decision authorization process. Uh, namely, their contribution is going to be so little or so small, and the potential harm they're going to do to the decision-making process might be so huge uh, that Mill believes that it's better to leave them out of the suffrage. Then uh, we have filtering mechanisms uh, regarding local government. Mill believes that uh, local government should adhere to and should focus only on a, a certain relatively small set of uh, political decisions. Of course, local government can simultaneously be good uh, for improving citizens' capacities by giving every citizen, or at least most citizens, ability to participate in some form of decision-making process, like being the member of the board of directors of a public library or a theater, or being the member of the Miesni Odbor, I'm not like a council of some small municipality or something like that. Uh, those are the things that actually uh, enable wider political participation. Nonetheless, Mill is aware that this type of political participation, when you have to go for a meeting once a month or once every three months and discuss whether the public library spend their funds adequately or not, this will help you. Nonetheless, uh, this will not uh, put a huge responsibility on citizens. And when there is no direct responsibilities, citizens tend to get sloppy. So if we put important decisions, and if we leave important decisions uh, to the local community, we might, we might end up with really bad legislation. This is the reason why Mill wants national legislation to handle all important uh, things regarding, for example, rights and liberties of citizens regarding the economy, uh, economics and so on. And he wants the local government to handle only those less important issues where if something goes wrong, no huge damage will be the result of this uh, mistake in the process. Mill also uh, goes in favor of filtering mechanisms such as rejection of pledges. The idea is that uh, once you become a member of the parliament, you are not bound uh, by the opinions of the people who have elected you. Why is this important? Well, this is important to make compromises in the parliament. Uh, because once you are a member of the parliament, uh, you have a duty not only to deliberate, uh, discuss and defend uh, positions uh, of uh, people who have elected you, but you also in the end have to vote uh, for the uh, laws or political decisions uh, that will best uh, improve the interests of your uh, fellow uh, political citizens, those who have elected you, but also those that will best improve the interests of the entire political community. And in order to do that, you need to be able to negotiate with others. You need to be able to some, sometimes even change your positions, change your arguments and so on, when faced with better arguments from the other side and so on. And this can only be done if there are no pledges in the uh, electoral process. And of course, one important uh, filtering mechanism is the division of uh, labor uh, between representative and administrative or executive government. Uh, this, uh, well, this uh, table here actually shows us, and it's very important, I think, uh, it shows us how Mill saw political participation of various stakeholders in the decision-making process. So first, Mill distinguishes between two types of processes, decision authorization process and decision-making process. Decision-making process is the one when a group of people, typically a small group of people like five, 10, 20 people, sit down around the table, have a coffee, and uh, decide how they are going to make particular political decisions, how they are going to, for example, name the streets in the uh, local community, how are they going to uh, distribute the extra money earned by the, by the company, how are they going to, I don't know, um, 
organize uh, funding for scientific projects and so on. This is decision-making process. Uh, and for me, the decision-making process has to uh, rely on technical or instrumental or scientific knowledge by those who are experts in the field. We also have another process, important process. Mill, Mill says that from the political standpoint, this is the more important process. And it's a decision authorization process. This is the process which gives legitimacy to political decisions. And this is the process in which citizens can vote, in which parliament discusses about laws uh, made by the experts and so on and so on. So basically for me, it's important to focus on this differentiation between two types of processes. And now how do citizens, how do members of the parliament and professionals and experts participate in this kind of processes? First, in the decision authorization process, citizens participate indirectly. Uh, in, okay, if there is a referenda, uh, in that case, they participate directly. But in most cases, in the decision authorization process, citizens participate indirectly, since they vote in the elections for political parties and for political representatives who are going to represent them in the parliament. Citizens rarely, except in referendums, uh, directly participate in the decision authorization process regarding some uh, collective decision. Now, decision authorization process also has a, a direct participation phase and it takes place in the parliament. There, members of the parliament authorized by the citizens after the elections deliberate and vote in the parliament and directly authorize political decisions and laws. So this is, and so far goes for decision authorization process. When we talk about decision making process, Mill again says we can differentiate between indirect and direct participation. Members of the parliament, but also citizens, for example, public intellectuals writing in the newspapers or um, I don't know, uh, NGOs making petitions and protests and so on. So, both members of the parliament and citizens, NGOs, institutes, and so on, indirectly participate in the decision-making process by providing suggestions, criticisms, by indicating their aims, their values, and so on. And direct participation is actually left to experts and professionals. That small group of 10, 20, 30 experts sitting around, uh, those who have technical knowledge and expertise to actually draft legislation, to draft political decisions. Nonetheless, and this is extremely important, although they are experts in the field uh, and they are elected to be there because they are experts, uh, this does not give them political legitimacy or political authority. Uh, a group of experts making a new law uh, does not have legitimacy to put this law into action. If a group of best economics uh, or a group of, um, I don't know, best experts in uh, climate change uh, sit, uh, sits together and decided that we have to, I don't know, uh, reduce pollution by cutting down or shutting down some industries or some factories. They do not have legitimacy to go out and bomb the factory or to force it to close. All they have is actually the ability to propose legislation to the decision authorizing body, in this case, the parliament, uh, which then uh, see and the authority uh, to maybe a little bit amend, maybe to change it a little bit, but basically, according to Mill, endorse or not to endorse this particular proposal of legislation, this particular proposal of political decisions and so on. Uh, apart from these filtering mechanisms I've put so far, there are also two very important ones uh, I'm going to uh, discuss in the final part. And these are his plural voting proposal and uh, his epistemic value of partisanship. Uh, Marco Luca, how am I with the time? Uh, I, was, uh, I was thinking about speaking for one hour, but I can do it shorter if you think uh, better to do it like to end. Well, maybe about 10 minutes more or something. 10 minutes, perfect. Cool. Yeah. Great, great, thank you.
Thanks. So uh, the two, maybe not the most important uh, filtering mechanisms, but from the academic standpoint, the most interesting uh, filtering mechanisms uh, for me uh, are his idea of plural voting proposal. Basically, uh, and in short, Mill believes that although all citizens who are above some minimum level of education and competence should have voting rights, voting privileges, uh, not all of them should have equal political influence. So the idea is those who are more competent should have greater political influence in the decision authorization, and not only in decision making, but also in the decision authorization process. Uh, the idea starts from Mill's ethics of voting. Uh, Mill basically believes that there is no such thing as a right to power over others. Therefore, uh, I never have a right uh, to affect other people's lives. Uh, I, or unconditional right to affect other people's lives. I can have that right conditionally if it's the least, <laughs> the, the smallest evil, or if it's the best way uh, to, in fact, minimize harm in a society. Therefore, electoral suffrage should be understood, according to Mill, primarily as a privilege and not as an unconditional or even conditional right. When necessary laws, policies, political decisions have to be made, no individual has an inherent right to participate in decision authorization process. Citizens' participation is conditional and depends on their ability to contribute to the epistemic qualities of the process. Of course, since Mill believes that representative democracy combined with deliberation and filtering mechanisms is the best decision authorization procedures, citizens, at least those with some education, have both a conditional right and the duty to participate in the decision authorization process. Because Mill believes that wide popular participation in the decision authorization process of citizens above this threshold will have the best epistemic consequences uh, for uh, long-term uh, cooperation. But why then Mill proposes plural voting proposal? Why does he propose that people have unequal political influence based on their education and their competences? Well, there are a few reasons. First, Mill believes that this will prevent class legislation. It will prevent one huge class, for example, workers in the 19th century in UK uh, from having almost all political power. And we see here again how epistemic value of agonism and political conflict comes in question. He wants to actually stop one class from dominating the political arena. And he, he says plural voting proposal will help us do that because those better educated or those bells educated are always in the minority in a, within a society. Second, he believes that uh, this has an uh, educative qualities. It prevents equality from uh, exercising a harmful effect on citizens' minds. Basically, plural voting proposal will publicly uh, show that having more education is better, more valuable than having less education. And in the end, citizens will be, or at least Mills believes citizens will be, uh, kind of uh, nudged, uh, pushed uh, towards improving and self-improving themselves. This, will not, this is not, uh, they're not pushed directly, but they are slightly nudged or advised. Uh, there's a beneficial influence on citizens' mind showing them that education is more valuable than ignorance. And finally, and the one that I focus most is uh, his uh, focus on competence. Basically, Mill believes that voting proposal, this we think political influence unequally will improve the, the quality of political outcomes by improving political aims. Uh, let's not forget that political decisions in the end are made primarily by technical experts. So uh, your level of education has nothing to do with uh, your ability uh, to participate in the decision authorization uh, or decision-making process, in fact. The idea is basically that if I have PhDs in philosophy, this will not make me a better bridge maker or a better doctor and so on. When we make political decisions in medicine or in engineering, we know who the experts are, uh, a narrow, small group of experts who are there to make the best instrumental 
uh, to, to find the best instruments or to make the best decisions. Nonetheless, Mill's idea is that having a PhD in philosophy or PhD in medicine, PhD in engineering can help you uh, make better political aims. Mill's basic idea is that citizens who have invested time in their education, in their self-perfection and so on, are more capable of thinking about what is variable within a society. And this is the reason why their competence comes into play. So their competence doesn't come into play here in the decision-making process, but in the decision authorization process, because by having a clearer or a better vision of what is a variable life and how society should look like, and by giving me, as someone who is like better educated, a greater political influence, I will be able to exercise this influence by voting for people in the parliament who will then improve or uh, defend these very same ideas and political aims. And this will, in the end, improve the quality of political decisions. Not directly, because in both cases, we'll have experts making political decisions, but because we'll be able to provide better input for the experts, a better vision of the future we want them to make instruments for. And finally, <clears throat> uh, Mill also talks about partisanship a lot. Uh, and most contemporary scholars think that Mill uh, really hated the idea uh, of political parties and the idea of people voting for political parties. And some of uh, his writings can indeed support this interpretation. Nonetheless, and this is again the novel part of my reading, Mill firmly believed that parties are not and that parties should not be vehicles of self-interest individuals or groups. But instead, Mill saw parties as collective sources of knowledge and experience that can be improved and used to produce better political decisions. Basically, Mill believed that political parties have a lot of epistemic virtues and can be used to improve the quality of legislation. First, as Mill says, uh, Parties provide civic education to the masses because they connect from the one side those who already have political experience with those who have uh, who do not have any political experience uh, and uh, who don't know how to participate in the political arena. Also, uh, Mill believes that uh, political parties can have protect uh, citizens' interests and uh, it can even help us counter epistemic injustice. Namely, uh, in many instances, uh, people are unable to voice their concerns or even to, uh, to fully form uh, words or expressions that will help them resolve the problems they are facing because they are not hermeneutically even capable of grasping what the problems are. Mill believes that political parties, uh, like any other form of deliberation within a small group, like women deliberate, he, has, he actually has this case of uh, in Chicago in uh, 1861, uh, there was like a women congress, uh, suffragette uh, uh, women congress debating that they should get right to vote and so on and other political rights. Uh, and Mill said this was extremely epistemically valuable because it was a congress where only women participated. And during that deliberation, uh, having the same problems and the same perspectives, <coughs> they were able to produce new meanings, to produce new terms, and to consolidate themselves to be able to politically participate in the future. However, Mill also believes that partisanship can help us organize citizens' competences, uh, for example, keeping the public uh, or keeping the, uh, some important perspectives from being too fragmented and so on. Uh, and partisanship can help us foster the spirit of compromise because political parties in the end in the parliament do a lot of negotiations and a lot of compromises, thus uh, teaching uh, party members and people who vote for political parties that politics is not only about getting political power and doing what you teach, think should be done, but in fact, the process of deliberating, discussing and meeting other people halfway. And now, finally, and this is the final chapter, and I'm going to uh, rush through it. Uh, there is some concern that this epistemic uh, 
aspects in mill political philosophy uh, draw him towards some kind of paternalism. Namely, as we famously know, Mill is a strong anti-paternalist. Mill says the state should not force you, the state should not limit your freedom uh, for reasons that are related only to your own well-being. If you want to drink, the state should not forbid you from drinking, even if it does you harm. If you want to smoke or to do drugs or to, I don't know, uh, do parachute uh, diving and so on, <clears throat> uh, the state should allow you to take such risks if you think this is good for you or if you want to live your life that way. The only reason why the state should be allowed to interfere with your freedom is if you uh, harm legitimate interests of other citizens, or if you fail to perform some duty you have, like for example, if you are a police officer and you drink on duty, in that case, you are actually failing a public duty you have towards others. So the, the state has to sanction you if you drink as a police officer on duty and so on. Nonetheless, the basic idea is uh, we should not censor citizens, nor should we uh, prohibit them from doing something if that doesn't harm any other citizen. So if one section uh, does not harm interests of others, society is not allowed to interfere or to regulate such uh, action. And of course, if regulating the behavior that harms others will produce better overall consequences that keeping it aren't regulated, we are allowed and we have a duty to regulate those kinds of behavior and those kinds of actions. And the argument goes forward, if there is more than one way to regulate some actions that harm legitimate interests of others, we have to implement a regulation that produces the best results or that minimizes harms done to others and to society in general. And finally, when some actions harm legitimate interests of others, and when some form of regulation is better than none, we have, and this is an important part, a moral duty to employ epistemically the best decision-making procedure to regulate those actions. So basically what I'm trying to show in the final chapter, and I'm going to talk about it tomorrow when I talk about continuous diseases and mill, is that from Mill's liberalism portrayed in harm principle, we can draw argument for Mill's epistemic democracy and his um, idea that there is a moral duty to employ epistemically the best decision-making and decision authorization procedure to regulate actions. And of course, and again, Mill is convinced that democracy characterized by these filtering mechanisms uh, is epistemically and instrumentally the best procedure for producing high quality legislation and efficient decisions. So uh, filtering mechanisms are compatible with anti-paternalism and their justification can be grounded in harm principle, not only in uh, some kind of paternalist notions, but in anti-paternalist harm principle. So they are consistent with Mill's political thought. And uh, that's it. Sorry for taking uh, so much of your time, uh, but uh, I'll stop sharing the screen now. And uh, I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much, Ivan, for a very rich and provocative and interesting talk. I have a ton of questions and, and points of contention, but I will, since we have like 15 to 20 minutes of, of q and I will leave the floor to others. Mm -hmm. So do we have some questions? Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of questions I see uh, in uh, that maybe Tom uh, and uh, Emilia uh, would like to, I mean, I can read them, but maybe it's better yeah. if you ask them now. Maybe uh, I think they can, yeah, just appear and then... yeah, I think that they can maybe, uh, Ask them. Uh, okay, let me. And, and Gabriel am I is. Coming through? Am I coming through? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. So my question is actually kind of like epistemic virtue, or epistemic, uh, yeah, uh, related. Uh, I think that the entire argument here is based, or the interpretation is based on the relation between uh, this kind of an intrinsic morality and the ability of mill system to produce epistemic value. Am I correct on that? Because kind of like you went, I mean, it's kind of nice, you went full circle, right? You started with the question and then you went full circle and went back to it and said, yeah, it's actually closely related. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually asking, is, is, it, is, is this question the same question 
which is made in virtue epistemology between epistemic virtues and moral virtues. Is that the same question? Or for instance, open-mindedness, right? Mm -hmm. Or whatever. Excellent. Uh, thank, thank you so much for the question. I think I, um, I hope I, I grasped what was the, the, the central part of the question. And actually, I discuss it a little bit, if I understood it correctly. I discuss it a little bit in the third chapter. Namely, the thing is, since Mill is primarily a utilitarian consequentialist philosopher and is focused on the moral quality of end states. So when Mill says we have to focus or we have to evaluate uh, decision making and decision authorization procedures based on their ability to produce beneficial consequences. These beneficial consequences are basically defined in a moral way. They are like utilitarian, of course, sophisticated utilitarian beneficial consequences. So I think that the question uh, uh, Tom has in mind is basically, uh, but what about epistemic values? So what kind of these beneficial consequences Mill has in mind? Are there moral or are there epistemic, uh, epistemically beneficial consequences or morally beneficial consequences? Uh, and the same worry is actually uh, put forward by Richard Arneson. Uh, he has a paper in which he distinguishes between a narrow and wide instrumentalism. A narrow instrumentalism, uh, which is typically, uh, or in most cases, like 78-80% uh, of cases, uh, used when we talk within deliberate uh, and epistemic democracy, basically focuses on the quality of political decisions. So what is the beneficial result? The beneficial result is political decision, particular law. And then we evaluate whether this type of decision-making procedure produced the best laws, the best political decisions. And this is like narrow instrumentalism. Uh, there are good reasons uh, to say that Mill was not a narrow instrumentalist. And there are also good reasons to say that if Mill was <laughs> a narrow instrumentalist, that he was basically wrong, because there are some uh, decision-making procedures uh, closer to expertism and epistocracy and so on that have really high tendency to produce really good political decisions in the end, better than uh, scholocracy or Mill's filter democracy. Nonetheless, I think we should read Mill as a wide instrumentalist, the one who is not concerned with evaluating only the quality of particular laws and decisions, but with the quality of all political consequences and social consequences that come out after using some decision-making procedure. For example, the effect on citizens' minds or the effect on citizens' competences uh, and uh, citizens' education, for example, is not something that can simply be grasped with evaluating the quality of decisions or the quality of laws. It is something that has to do with the consequences of a procedure, but not with the most direct consequences like laws and decisions and policies, but with the overall social and political and economic consequences of uh, a procedure. So basically, uh, Mill can be understood as a wide instrumentalist, one focusing not only on decisions and laws, but also on the overall consequences produced by a decision-making procedure. And now how do we, uh, are those in the end moral or epistemic? Uh, Mill's idea is basically that they are epistemic, uh, sorry, that they are moral in the end. Uh, so the idea is uh, epistemology comes in, I mean, but in utilitarianism, those two things are quite connected. When we are talking about what is a good life, you're also talking about how can we know that something is a good life. When you talk about what are the beneficial consequences, you are also having in mind that uh, you must have a procedure on how to assess what are the good consequences and so on and so on. So actually, uh, consequentialists tend to combine epistemic and moral uh, consequences. And to finally answer Tom's question, the idea is basically these are moral consequences, uh, the best results in a moral way. Nonetheless, it's combined and kind of filled with epistemic considerations as well, because uh, improvement of citizens, self-improvement of citizens' intellectual and moral capacities can also be seen as an epistemic, epistemically valuable consequence. Thank you. Amelia, would you like to? Yeah, well, thank Sorry. you very much. Um, actually, you quite uh, answered to my question during your uh, 
um, the continuing of your presentation. So uh, I'm glad. I uh, was wondering about the definition of education, and you partially answered to that. So I'm glad it means that I was correctly following your reasoning. So mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Gabriel, was I correct in what you? Yeah, so good. Go ahead. Yes, sorry, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I'll just put the um, speakers a little bit louder, but okay, I can hear Okay, okay. Um, hi, I'm, um, yeah, my name is Gabriel Serbu. I'm also here uh, um, a member, a fellow at the SAS, at the Center for Advanced Studies in Rijeka. I'm just, um, uh, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not a political philosopher, so I'm, I'm sorry if, if my question will be a bit, uh, maybe it will sound a bit uh, simplistic. Uh, I was only, I just want to refer to um, uh, to that point in your uh, uh, speech, when, in your talk, when you were um, referring to um, uh, individual self-improvement and self-development, mm -hmm. so this idea of self-improvement and uh, self-development. Um, and I was wondering, um, what would uh, what would you respond uh, to to someone who uses the same rhetoric of self improvement and self development um, uh, to in order to promote uh, neoliberal values? Now, uh, by neoliberal values, I'm referring. Uh, um, I'm, I'm just uh, referring to. Um, uh, I'm thinking of a. Uh, of, uh, um, French philosopher uh, who recently, Barbara Stiegler, um, who uh, recently uh, uh, like shares an article from 2000 uh, where she criticizes, of course, uh, neoliberalism. And um, she explains how uh, the rhetoric, let's say, the, the, the rhetoric of neoliberalism has appropriated a kind of Darwinian vocabulary uh, that is uh, and and the, the, the main the, whose values are evolution selection mutation adaptation competition um, so I I'm not sure if maybe some uh, in, in, in some way this rhetoric of self-improvement can be related to this kind of uh, also to this kind of um, uh, neoliberal rhetoric and um, yeah, I, I, I'm wondering to myself because I'm not sure how to <laughs> to think about this. And if, if uh, of course, it's related also to education. If, if uh, you know, like like should school or universities uh, promote this kind of? I mean, how how should they differentiate? Let's say, or how how? Uh, yeah, this this is it. Thank you, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the question. <clears throat> uh, so yeah, um, uh, I. I think I see two questions here. The first one is uh, like a clarificatory one. Uh, what is self-improvement or individual self-improvement per mill? And can it be kind of related to or connected to this uh, new liberal values or this neo-Darwinism uh, that takes place in, in some kind of uh, liberal, uh, liberal theory? Well, uh, for Mill, uh, Mill, Mill did not have in mind any uh, Darwinistic uh, ideas when we, when he was talking about self improvement. Uh, for Mill, basically, uh, one of the, I mean, education has different purposes for Mill. One can be technical education, like being an engineer and able to build better bridges and so on. And of course, that is important. But education has other important uh, aspects for Mill, and that is uh, one related to personal freedom. It enables you to uh, see and to comprehend your choices better. But you know, in the end, in the, this utilitarian, uh, sophisticated utilitarian uh, moral way, uh, education helps you uh, get better acquainted with something Mill calls higher pleasures. Uh, for Mill, uh, so uh, to wrap it up, utilitarianism basically says that uh, when we evaluate different kinds of actions and so on, uh, we should uh, evaluate as morally correct uh, actions, those that produce the higher amount of utility. And utility was typically understood as pleasure. For example, Jeremy Bentham, a philosopher before Mill, uh, actually said like, yes, those actions that produce the highest amount of utility for 
everyone are the morally correct actions and so on. Uh, however, there is this typical like, would you rather be a, a very happy pig or a very sad Socrates and so on. So Mills had this idea that, yeah, there is something good about utilitarianism. Nonetheless, there is something bad about this hedonistic part in utilitarianism. There should be something else more important. And Mills idea is that we should differentiate between lower and higher pleasures. Lower pleasures are like, um, I know uh, most of the pleasures that do not engage our higher intellectual and moral capacities, like uh, drinking, uh, like, uh, I don't know, uh, having sex all around and so on, uh, or enjoying in violence or even enjoying in some kind of uh, very simple activities. Uh, and then we have higher pleasures. Higher pleasures are those that are more intellectually uh, demanding, uh, but they don't have to be academic. Like having a, a, a meaningful friendship with someone can also be a higher value <clears throat> or a higher pleasure or reading a good book uh, or enjoying, a, 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 I don't know, culture and so on. Uh, enjoying things that are distinctly human for us that differentiate from other animals and so on. So for me, self-improvement is actually a process of getting better acquainted uh, with higher pleasures. Uh, so that would be to answer the first question about self, uh, the definition of self-improvement. Mill's idea is that by self-improvement, we are actually uh, discovering better things about ourselves as human beings and not as animals who go around, drink, fuck, and so on. And now the other one, should schools, uh, uh, should school uh, should schools uh, like uh, promote uh, self improvement in these uh, higher pleasures? Or the other question that I'm also adding: Should schools promote these neoliberal values like uh, new neo Darwinism and so on? Well, for first one, Mill would most likely sell, uh, say yes. Uh, but the idea is uh, the schools should do that. Uh, and that's not paternalistic because we are talking about kids, those who are below the competence threshold. So the schools should promote it, but in the end, they cannot finally, the schools are promoting preconditions for our self-improvement. Because in schools, in at least in most cases, how Mill perceives formal education, you are not self-improving yourself, you are improving yourself or other people are helping you to improve according to an existing curricula. Uh, issued by the ministry and so on and so on. So you are in fact improving yourself, but you are not self-improving yourself. Mill's idea is yes, the schools should enable citizens uh, to be better acquainted with higher pleasures by, I don't know, having compulsory reading in uh, literature, you know, reading, uh, I don't know, Dostoevsky and um, Shakespeare and so on in elementary school or in high school and so on. Uh, that is good, but Actually, by doing that, we are merely developing our capacities for later self-improvement. For me, self-improvement actually starts after you finish the formal schooling, university or uh, you know, high school or something like that, when you actually start to direct your own interests towards things that are important to you, uh, then when you are in the, in the wheel of your improvement. <laughs> uh, so yeah, for me, the schools should develop capacities for uh, higher pleasure in students, uh, but mostly because this is a precondition for their self-improvement and not because it's good in, 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 the, in itself. And second, should, should schools uh, promote uh, like neo-Darwinism and so on? Well, it seems to me that probably not or not by itself. Uh, I, I'm guessing that there are some uh, values or maybe even some principles coming from neo-Darwinism that could be useful in put in right contexts, like responsibility for your, your own action, resp taking responsibility for your own fate and for what you do and so on. Proactive approach towards um, society and so on might be, uh, might be things that schools want to develop uh, in kids. Of course, when combined with other values that are not <laughs> neo-Darwinistic values, like cooperation, like the idea of sharing the same fate with the rest of your political community and so on and so on. So the idea is basically, because Mill is, Mill, Mill believes that putting the responsibility on an individual in many cases helps individual improve himself. If you have like social services, uh, pay, you, you are unemployed, but you get money all the time by the social services. Uh, you don't want to, um, 
I don't know, uh, perfect some of your skills, but unless someone else helps you to go through life and so on, you are constantly dependent on others and you are actually not improving yourself. So in a way, uh, being responsible for your own actions and so on uh, is a an value and a principle that is important. And if such a principle is there in neo-Darwinism, uh, saying that you should do the best out of yourself, you should uh, try to uh, be better than others and so on, it can be a good way even for me to develop once uh, uh, one's uh, intellectual capacities, moral capacity, and so on, but it should not be the only way that children are taught in school. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have maybe some a last question? If not, I would sort of have a small, mm -hmm. just a small question. Do you think, I mean, I'm, I'm actually a ton of questions, but I will try to sort of focus very <laughs> small one. Like, without even going into the, the wider sort of uh, epistemology of uh, epistemological concerns with, with sort of schoolocracy and, and, uh, and this giving more weight to, to more educated and, and so forth, just within the confines of like Mills, his own like theory, do you think that there is a does not does it not appear that there is a sort of a strong tension between the sort of instrumentalist uh, argument for free speech and this colocratic argument? Namely, in the the idea is that knowledge is unequally distributed in the population, but it is unpredictably unequally distributed in the population, and this is within the sort of instrumentalist argument, this comes to the fore because we need free speech precisely because of the unpredictability of, of potential sort of defeaters and, and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. then when it comes to scholocracy, suddenly this unpredictability is, appears sort of completely abandoned. Mm -hmm. And in, in a sense, you know, this is, this is where it comes that scholocracy would actually be sort of epistemically detrimental precisely because it would sort of shoot itself in the foot in a sense uh, with regards to harvesting the unpredictably distributed knowledge. So yeah. I think that there is a tension between those two arguments. I mean, may, but maybe I'm mm -hmm. missing something. So I just want to... Uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, yeah, um, I think we definitely have a chance. I, I'm definitely looking forward to discussing this with you uh, during COVID, but just to give, I don't think that there is a tension. Uh, and the reason why there is no tension here, or at least I perceive there is no tension, uh, is that uh, free speech and scholocracy uh, have very different roles and are applied in different uh, contexts. So when we talk about instrumental and epistemic value of free speech, we're talking about uh, actions uh, that in fact do not uh, directly and in most cases indirectly, affect the legitimate interests of others. Uh, in fact, Mill has uh, in On Liberty this famous, like, you are allowed to profit, to censor free speech if someone is standing in front of the, I don't know, uh, some rich man's villa and saying, let's go burn it down, uh, he, he robbed us, and so on and so on. Or if someone is coming in front of the, I don't know, uh, Jewish ghetto and saying the same things and so on. <clears throat> Uh, but in all other cases, Mill says, of course, uh, we should not censor free speech and so on, because by doing that, we are uh, doing a disservice not, not only to the individual who is being censored, but to the entire community. Uh, actually, they, are, they, they don't receive the opportunity to exchange their potentially wrong ways with the correct ones and so on and so on. But the idea is, we are talking about free speech in the context in which uh, no one's uh, well-being is directly affected. Uh, now, uh, scholocracy, on the other hand, uh, deals with decision-making and decision authorization processes in which you are exercising power over others. So when you are uh, exercising your free speech, you are not exercising power over others. And when you are voting in the elections, for example, or when members of the parliament uh, authorize some law, uh, in such cases, they are actually exercising power over others because these laws uh, have legitimacy. And if you are you don't abide by that law, they have the state has the authority to put you in prison and so on. Uh, so the basic idea is that the contexts are quite different. So uh, in one, there is no direct or indirect harm to the others. Uh, 
And in the other, there is this idea that uh, uh, if we give too much power to ignorance, uh, the end results might be uh, very harmful to some or to the entire society. So uh, Mill actually, and this is very interesting, I actually wrote a paper on this, but never published it. I presented it in Furia Symposium, some student symposium long time ago. And it's about like Mill between Plato and Aristotle. And it's, it, it's beautiful in fact, because you have Plato saying, uh, we should focus on uh, how competences are distributed in a society and those most competent should rule. Then you have Aristotle saying basically, no deliberation is the answer. Uh, everyone should have the ability to participate in the discussion, decision-making and so on, because the best decisions will come out. And Mill is somewhere in between. He basically says, yes, there is something epistemically valuable about diversity, but there is also something epistemically valuable about competence, which is unequally distributed. Uh, so actually his holocracy uh, approach and the uh, theory of holocracy tries to actually meet uh, something between Aristotle and Plato. Um, and of course, uh, just to finish, to wrap it up, uh, Mill's idea is basically like, there is a higher chance that, that those who have received some level of education and the more, or there, there is some correlation between those who have received higher levels of education or perform more demanding jobs and uh, one's ability to recognize, improve and so on higher pleasures or to recognize more important aims within a society and so on. Uh, and basically what he's saying is, of course there's, no guarantee that those having, uh, I don't know, uh, being full professors at Harvard will also be, uh, you know, those more acquainted with higher pleasures or will be able to get what is politically important, what are the valuable aims, but they are more likely to be like that. Uh, and so that is uh, basically Mill's idea. The important thing here is that Mill even doesn't have some concrete idea, some particular idea, of what are the valuable aims. He's basically saying that in order to be a full professor at Harvard, you have to use your intellectual abilities and maybe your, or possibly your moral abilities as well, uh, to a certain extent, uh, and you are going to train them by using them. And in the end, the aims uh, or the, the, the values you end up holding uh, will be better supported, will be closer to some kind of higher pleasures than those uh, by someone who is like reading newspapers 15 minutes a day during coffee and then is doing something else that doesn't uh, put burden and pressure uh, on his intellectual and moral abilities. And this idea is basically that by exercising, just like with physical training, when you lift weights, you are actually becoming stronger. And when you are thinking about problems, uh, moral problems, uh, ethical problems, but also other problems, uh, you are actually developing your capacities. This is actually one of the reasons my, why me believes that uh, education should not be the only, or though it's the most important, should not be the only trace, uh, tracer or uh, identifier of uh, higher competence. He says someone who has only elementary school, uh, but is the CEO of, uh, I don't know, a huge firm uh, or huge enterprise pages about how to make a good business deals, about how to, uh, what to do with people asking for sick leave and so on and so on. That kind of person will be engaged with more moral problems than someone who is simply working there on, uh, on a track, like um, some simple job. And that is in general going to improve his or her capacity. Of course, it is whether, even if it is going to improve his or her uh, capacities, a question might be asked uh, whether this will in the end improve the qualities of the procedure, because as David Esselin famously argues, you might have some uh, latent uh, conjectural features, like he says, imagine that those better educated are also sexually more frustrated. So they are going to produce better laws, but in certain areas, they are going to produce worse laws than the uneducated and so on. So it is an, an ongoing discussion. I'm just trying to clarify what Mill had in mind. Thank you. And I also look forward to discussing this with you mm -hmm. more. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan, for your talk. And thank you, everybody, for <clears throat> joining us. Uh, our next seminar is next Thursday at 10 a.m., not at 12, so just keep that in mind. And 
have a great remainder of the day. Thank you once again, Ivan. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.